Sweet. So welcome everyone to the Grant Davies Prep Seminar. Um, for those of you who have seen me at Fall Open or other tournaments and stuff, this is probably going to be pretty familiar, stuff that I've done before. As I said, the cute animal pictures are going to be identical to the ones that were there during the middle of the week. Um, so first we're going to go through how to like research for debate, um, what you should be focusing on when you're trying to learn new things about debating. We're going to look at two systems of prep that I've developed. Obviously these are not exhaustive, um, nor do you have to like follow them to the letter to be a good debater. Uh, and then also just doing a little bit of wrap up and some takeaway messages for how to prep for debate in general, as well as how to prep for debate when you're going into specific rounds of debate. So the goals of research. You are not looking for answers necessarily when you're doing research. Rather, what you are doing is, ask, is looking for the right questions, is trying to figure out, OK, if I have a topic about something or other, what are the important questions I should be asking myself in that round? What are the important things for me to remember when I'm presenting that round? So yeah, once again, like yeah, also not facts to be repeated. You're not looking for answers. You're looking for the questions. You're also looking for the connections between things. You're looking between, for connections between people. You're looking for why those connections exist in the first place and what they are doing. So you're trying to build sort of a web of understanding of, OK, this topic is related to this topic. These actors are related to these actors and looking for those connections. You're also looking for underlying principles and motivations. This is why it can sometimes be really difficult to research for debate from like news sources. Um, because oftentimes they have quite a bit of spin that they're putting onto their underlying principles. So read things carefully and read things closely, especially if you suspect they are non-factual in nature, and look for the underlying principles of that movement rather than what kind of spin they are projecting. And that can be both positive and negative principles depending on what you're looking for in that specific instance. Um, I bring up the prints because it's an excellent starting block for a lot of poli-sci stuff. So in terms, that's sort of where I wanted to go with research. Fairly straightforward, like we don't do a lot of homework for debate. But this is just, if you are reading an article, those are the things that you should be looking out for if you're doing so as debate prep specifically. So in terms of seeing resolutions and how to prep for that, I'm going to go through two systems. The first one I call the Tree of Strife, and the other one is called Foursquare. And we'll go through both of them. But the general idea is resolution goes up. You have nothing, you have no idea what's going on. What do you do in that instance? Uh, in this case, it's my favorite verb of violence proper noun. So in the case of this house would invade Syria, for instance, this was made last year, um, but it's equally as relevant now, uh, except we would change it to IS. There is, the first part is just breaking it down into its component parts. So the house is always relevant. There is always a house that you have to be discussing. So that's always going to be your first category, no matter what the resolution is. You're also going to be looking at the verb of that resolution, which is to invade. And then you're going to be looking for the subject of that resolution, which in this case would be the IS or Syria. So the first thing to do is to ground yourself by breaking down resolutions that you don't understand or don't know a lot about into their component parts, because that's going to help you do everything that follows afterwards. It's also useful because it starts to get you into structure that the most effective way of prepping is to have a series of steps that you will take. And so getting yourself into that routine and into that process helps alleviate sort of the, the fear of, oh my, there's something that I don't know. Um, I have to think about everything and anything possible. It's like, no. Start out the same way every time. Start and try and get your system rolling. So when you're talking about an invasion, what kind of thing does that involve? It, so you're asking the basic five W's and how. Same kind of stuff you've been taught to do since elementary school for preparing for essays and exam questions and things like that. So you're looking for you know, what, so in this case, you know, there's going to be an army involved. There's going to be a before, there's going to be a during, there's going to be an after in terms of these operations and establishing all of the different pieces of what is going on. You're also going to be asking for who is involved in the invasion, probably the house, but also the people that you're invading, coalition members potentially that you want to bring into it. How does one invade or how does one not invade? And so here you're looking for guidelines and metrics especially that you can say this will be a successful invasion because we're going to do these things that we consider to be good metrics for success. We're going to avoid these other possible um, things we could do because we think that those lead to bad outcomes. You're also looking for why generally would we invade something. So what has, hap like, what has happened in the past? Did they work? Did they not? This is where having historical examples can actually be quite useful, is answering you know, 
Why are we doing this? What is the context for what we're doing? And so you would do that as well for the house that you choose, whoever it is. You would also do it for the subject, um, but I don't want to go through all of that because we have limited amounts of time. So, but once you have that basic groundwork of your first sort of layers, you want to start looking at how they connect with one another. So you're looking at places where they intersect, places where they differ, so that you can do sort of that comparative understanding of the topic that you're being asked to discuss. Um, so that's the second level of prep, is then looking again for those interactions. Uh, and so this is sort of a summary and making it a little bit more in depth, is that you are looking for breaking down the resolution into its component parts. So that's your action, your nouns, your adjectives, and your subordinate clauses. You break those <laughs> down into their own meanings and aspects one by one. And the great part about this prep strategy is that if you had infinite amounts of prep time, you could keep on doing this and create more and more layers of the tree. But since you only have 15 minutes, you're probably only going to do like two or three layers of the tree. And that will be a reasonable <coughs> enough amount of depth for you to start making your arguments and preparing your case. It's also important to note that when you're doing this kind of stuff, it doesn't immediately lead you straight to the arguments you're going to use. This is more of a brainstorming technique so that you can build up a base of knowledge to inform those arguments that you're going to actually use. So in terms of verbs and actions, things to remember. All actions have someone or something that is acting. So they are, there has to be a subject, a who of your resolution. All actors have responsibilities, they have powers, they have limits, and they have interests. And so whenever you've identified an actor in a resolution, you can immediately then go another layer of depth with at least those four things. And those are all going to be useful things to brainstorm in terms of clash, as well as in terms of the constructive material you use. And further then, all actions have consequences. The ones you want to happen, the ones that are going to happen whether you want them or not, and the ones that are going to happen despite the fact you don't want them to happen. There's also the unknowns of like, well, what if something totally unexpected happens, um, which I didn't include in there. So all of those are things that you can immediately start to think about as soon as you've identified an actor. So that's eight questions that you could potentially ask yourself. Um, again, you can add a lot of depth using this strategy. So at a certain point, you have to cut yourself off and be like, OK, that's enough. I've answered enough questions. I have a reasonable argument that I can make. Same thing happens for proper nouns. All proper nouns exist within a context. They all have a history. And very rarely are they monolithic. Um, one of the greatest strategies that you can use as a debater in terms of proper noun cases is breaking down the proper noun in the resolution to all of the component, prop, like, component pieces. Realizing that like, talking about Canada is not always the best idea because Western Canada is very different from Eastern Canada is very different from Quebec, for instance. At a very basic level of breaking down that monolithic idea of what Canada wants is breaking it down into those component pieces. And you can do that even with like, very small groups you can even do that with an individual person, because an individual person has certain things that they like to do um, that define them in a way. And so like, as a debater, as a student, and as just like a, a normal human being, you would have different interests that you can break down that monolith, and that gets you a lot better information. Also, again, all nouns have interests, they have responsibilities, and they have powers. So those are other things that you can think about as soon as those proper nouns come up within a resolution. As an example, um, this house would ban child beauty pageants. So you have the house, which gets highlighted first. You have a ban, which immediately implies that there's some kind of government action going on. You have children that have all sorts of interesting things attached to them. And you have beauty pageants. So um, to sort of illustrate this, bam. So you've taken your resolution. Uh, sorry, you can't see it very well. You take the resolution, and you break it down into its three component parts. Uh, yeah. Okay. So yeah, so whenever you talk about a ban, you are immediately talking about a government that is doing the banning. So you can break down that government again into what is that specific <laughs> government's interests what are its limitations? What are its powers? What are its responsibilities? And immediately you have four important questions to ask just because you see the word ban. And those are all useful questions in that debate round. Because you're talking about children, children also have a limited or have a context. 
All children exist themselves as agents, limited as they are. They also have their parents and guardians and people who are responsible for them. And so seeing child immediately gives you two potential actors or subjects that you can start talking about. In terms of beauty pageants, you can break that down just like any other sporting event or competition into having a series of judges, sponsors, and participants, as well as spectators um, and in other interested parties. So from a very basic just deconstruction of the words that are in the topic, you suddenly get six different things that you can start to give arguments about. And that gives you a lot of immediate depth. Um, and you can ask very simple questions about all of those six actors in this resolution. And that will possibly fill up five minutes without having to think in a lot of depth about any of them right away. So the reasons why I like to use the Tree of Strife is that it provides a rapidly expanding web of important objects. Um, you won't need everything that you brainstorm using this technique, and it's also important that once you've brainstormed all of your branches of the trees to start to look at where they start to overlap. So if you're looking at the banning child beauty pageants, the government has different responsibilities towards children than it does towards parents, that the judges will interact differently with the children if they are sponsors or if they are participants versus if they are spectators and things like that. So you can start to build a lot of depth very quickly, and this works very well for resolutions that you don't know very much about, that you want to start to make educated guesses about how to improve that knowledge and improve that level of detail you can provide. The other one is something that I call Foursquare, and it's sort of based on using graphs to understand debate. So this is more for something where you actually do know a lot about it, but you're not sure how you want to answer the question that the debate is posing. So this is a way of giving context to the arguments that you plan on using, as well as the context to the round in general. It's a good way for categorizing and organizing rather than oftentimes brainstorming. So starting out with the positive is looking for the questions that are in proposition, basically. What do we want to do? Who is going to be intervening? What is, how would one intervene? Um, why would you intervene? So it's the basic positive questions. It's setting up a series of answers that you know in a context that you know, okay, these are the things that I want to talk about if I am on the proposition. Or if you're on op, these are the things the proposition is most likely to be talking about that I'm going to have to address. The negative is the flip side is what are the nots? How would we not intervene? Why would we not intervene? Um, who would not intervene? Why would it fail? Yada, yada, yada. Here you are looking for casting reasonable doubt on the proposition. So these are important things, A, for opposition to be doing, but A, or but for B, for proposition to also be preparing themselves to counter against. So again, it's organizing your knowledge into this positive and minus context. And what that allows you to do is start to come up with themes. Because once again, you're looking for places where those interact. You're looking for places where those overlap. And so you can start to identify that these are going to be the most critical issues of the round because both sides are talking about them. Both sides are going to be trying to win this point because it's on both sides of the chart. It's not just going to be an op argument or a prop argument. It's something that we call a point of stasis. It's somewhere where the two teams are really going to be clashing directly against each other, trying to win that point in one direction or the other. That allows you to focus in on those arguments because those are the ones that are going to be the most important. Those are the ones that are going to shift who wins the debate rather than simply who has intelligent things to say about the debate. And that's what you're looking for in terms of debating, is winning those points where you are in contention with the other team. Flipping down onto the bottom side of the chart, you have the alternatives. So this is where you are looking at what things could we do differently? What other ways could we accomplish the same objectives that we had in the positive square, the same ideas we want to promote, but do them in a different way? So this is useful both for the opposition as well as for the proposition, because it gives you opportunities to do comparative analysis between the things that the teams have said. So this is a place where it's a great idea as well, because you are actively identifying the goals that you have as the proposition or the opposition. So you are looking for why are we doing this at all? And that's also going to be very useful for helping you build perspective, helping you build worldview, and helping you build relevance. The double negative side is then the negative of those alternatives. So why don't the alternatives work? Why is doubt not feasible? Why do we have to do this? And so this is sometimes the most complicated question simply because it's going to be interacting with 
all three of the other squares, is that it is the sort of final considerations idea that it's what there is nothing else we could do. How can we make this necessary? How do we create this action as required? And that's where you start to build as well a lot of depth into your arguments. So this is to provide a system for context. Um, it's going through different perspectives and helping you not to forget things because it gives you an organizational capacity. One of the things that I think is very important talking about either one of these two um, prep strategies is that these are not the only ways to do it. These are just things that I have done in the past that I decided to systematize. And this is something that I recognize or like recommend to everyone, is that as you start to debate more and more, is start to try and make your thought process into a system that you can always follow. The best way to like not panic about a resolution is to immediately be able to have a system, a way that you are comfortable breaking down resolutions. And obviously, as novices, you're at your first debate tournament, you haven't been able to do this yet. It's something that I would really recommend that you try and do. It's something that you should be thinking about after rounds. OK, how did that prep time go? How was I building depth? How was I building context? How was I identifying issues? And then, because that gives you a basis to say, OK, I'm doing this well. This is working for me. Or I missed all of these things. My strategy obviously isn't working. What can I try and do instead? Hopefully, you're also going to be debating with a whole bunch of different people. And like I was saying during the week, steal from them. Not just their ideas, but how they arrive at them. Tre like, test out other people's prep strategies. Test out the ones that I gave you. See what elements work well for you, what elements don't work for you, what you would change, and sort of focus on that as you develop, because that's how you're going to get better at prepping. So are there any questions about prep in general? I didn't use all of the same features. Um, like there's also lots of other strategies you can look up online. You can also look at them from other disciplines. Like consulting has a whole bunch of stuff as well for doing these strategies that I just discovered this week. Um, so yeah, there are four elements of prep that I think are very important. So first is brainstorming. It's coming up with all of the ideas that you might want to use. It's just putting stuff out there so that you have established all of the stuff that you know about the resolution so you can start to attack them. Um, I think that's brainstorming. Yeah. The next then is organizing. So it's finding ways that you can start to constructively put those arguments together into thematic groups, into <laughs> stuff that is all interconnected, stuff that would make sense to argue about together. Then the next thing that you're looking for is curating. So you're trying to pull everything down into the most important parts once you sort of organize them a bit. So that you know, OK, what are going to be the most important things for me to talk about? And once you have those, then you have to put them together and figure out how do I flow those in an argument. So those are the ideal four pieces of prep for me so that you can go into the round and have your speech ready to go without having to like write out every single word. So whatever system that you are building should try and address your weakest point within that system, like within that flow of how you prep for a case. And of course, this is my elements of prep. This is what I've found to be very important um, as you debate, you may have different ideas. That's a really awesome thing to do. Um, as long as it works for you, it's good. There's no perfect way of debating or prepping, but this should give you an idea of what kind of systems we're looking for, like what kind of systems help. The next one is oh, ah, um, turning your arguing into debates. So here it is all about purpose. It is all about relevance. It is all about taking things that are factual or things that are logical, or things that make sense, and turning them into a debate rather than simply an argument. So you are looking for that relevance. You are looking for how does this further the debate? How do I win a debate using these arguments? So this is something that I struggle a lot with. I like to just like have a lot of information that I could put out there and like have in the round. Um, but it's all about bringing it to a point. It's all about making your hypothesis and your thesis directly related to what your arguments are saying and referring back to those all the time. is That's why I have the picture of the knight. Is you are trying to take all of the strength that you have in terms of arguments and push it and bring it to a point so that you can actually win. And that sounds super abstract and it's difficult, but you'll start to see it as you debate. That there are things that happen in debates which are facts, and there are things that happen in debate that are debates. And you are looking for that proving something with your arguments. Always be referring back to that relevance. 
question? And yeah, that's the end of the prep seminar. So hopefully that was kind of useful to give you an idea of strategies you can try out for debating and things you should be looking for in your prep. That's kind of the objective. So. Thank you.